Here is a stunning, largely unknown fact. Every year, thousands of people go missing in North America's forests, woods, and mountains. And it's not for lack of effort by all manner of people who go searching for them. It's all laid out in a new book called The Cold Vanish, Seeking the Missing in North America's Wildlands. And it brings the author, John Billman, to our virtual studio tonight from Marquette, Michigan. John, I was just telling you before we went on, this is one of the spookiest books I've ever read. It is something of, about which I suspect very few people know. So let's dive in. What's A Cold Vanish, the title of your book? Well, you know, it, it's um, in, in this day and age, in the, in the age of technology that we have available to us, that, that someone can just disappear um, with, without a trace is, is just still mind-boggling to me. And like you say, people uh, just aren't aware of just how many people do go missing in uh, North America's wildlands and public lands. Well, the assumption would be it's a very small number. Do you want to reset our idea on that? Well, it, you know, in, in relation to the urban missing, it, it is still a small number, but the fact that, that you can go missing and there just are no clues left. Um, so conservatively in the book, uh, we came up in the states of uh, that there's still 1,600, um, at least 1,600 active uh, missing persons cases out there. Um, but but it's just it's much more than people believe. Well, let me read something here. This is from Kevin Fedarko, who did a review of your book, who writes, most of us prefer to measure and celebrate nature in terms of its tendency to delight, to inspire, to instill awe. But there is another metric by which the power of wilderness can be calibrated, which lies in its capacity to take us between its teeth, tear us asunder, and swallow up whatever is left with such ruthless efficiency that no trace remains. Now, you yourself spent months in the Canadian and U.S. wild researching this book. How much do we need to be reminded of the fact that, um, well, there are places in this world where we are totally at the mercy of Mother Nature, right? Absolutely, Steve. And, and you know, um, I, I, I think with the, the media and, 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 like I say, that modern technology, we're lulled, lulled into this false sense of security. But, um, you know, even the, the first world is still uh, really wild. And um, I, I don't want to say dangerous, but, um, you know, the, the cases in the book, having researched this, um, you know, it's, it, it's sobering. So um, I, I think it's both exciting that we live in a wild world still, but, um, but some caution is appropriate. Indeed. Well, let's go through some of the notable cases that you do uh, chronicle in your book. And let's start with Mitchell Staling. Who was he? Yeah, th that's that's a really strange case, Steve. Um, da Mitchell Dale Staling was a, a, a Texas resident, 51 years old, and um, in 2013, he and his family were were just doing the typical uh, Western American tourist thing. They were visiting national parks in the West, and they went to uh, Mesa Verde National Park in southwestern Colorado. And and it's interesting because um, he became the only missing person in the history of that national park. That is bizarre indeed. Is there a working theory as to how he went missing in the first place? Their RV had broken down and they were just visiting literally the museum gift shop. And um, from the parking lot, you can see um, some cliff dwellings. And there is literally a wheelchair path paved to the dwellings. And it was, a, it was 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it was a hot day. And he, but he, he wasn't planning on going far. And um, he got he got to the dwellings and then decided he'd go a little further down a trail that was that was uh, a more rugged trail, but still very much um, you know tourist friendly. And um, some some tourists from Europe uh, claimed that they saw him, but that's the last that anyone had any contact with him. And you know he had a bad back; he wasn't prepared for for a long outing. Um, and you know uh, rangers searched for him thoroughly, and um, it, it's really strange that, that they couldn't locate him on that day. What's, what's uh, new about that case, in, in September, mid-September of this year, um, his, his remains were found, but, but the, the mystery uh, is still really deep on that case. Um, it, it's, it's unlikely where he was found. He was found in an area that had been very thoroughly searched previously, uh, seven years prior. And um, I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but that same week that Dale's remains were found, um, the, the remains of, of 20 
indigenous Native Americans were reburied. They had been taken to Finland in the 1890s um, by a uh, an archaeologist, and um, you know it just so happens that um, the remains that uh, had been missing for 100 years uh, coincided with the discovery of Dale's remains, which had been missing for seven years. Let's do another notable case. Who's Michael Linklater? My, Michael is, uh, uh, that took me to Ontario, uh, northern Ontario at the Abitibi River. And um, Michael is uh, was a 44-year-old uh, Cree gentleman um, whose family reported him missing in 2003. And um, that's another really strange one because um, uh, some people think that he's still out there in the bush uh, alive and just doesn't doesn't want to be found. I spent uh, 10 days up in the bush of northern Ontario with a with a, a searcher who specializes in cold cases in really remote places, uh, searching searching for Michael. And we found some clues, but we 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 didn't we didn't find him. What does his brother still do to this day? Leaves leaves food and uh, and warm clothing out for him. Hmm. So he clearly thinks he's still alive. Yes. Yeah. Is there any reason to believe that he is? Um, y yes, he's a, he's a keen survivalist. He, um, he, he's uh, a hunter, trapper. Uh, if anyone can survive out there, it would be Michael. Now, admittedly, this question's a little grim, but let's do it anyway here. When the corpses of the missing are found, they're very often unclothed. Why would that be? Yeah, um, people suffering hypothermia oftentimes will shed their clothing, Steve, because they, they feel like they're actually burning up. They're, they're, they're feverish and very, very hot. And um, so, so searchers will sometimes find articles of clothing, and that's how they can track somebody. But the real mystery is, you know, what led to the person succumbing to hypothermia in the first place? And that's, that's largely the unanswerable uh, part of, of that condition. There's another oddity as well, which is sometimes when bodies are found, they are found in areas that have already been searched or right beside a trail where people have walked by and yet somehow have been missed. How does that happen? That's a great question. I wish I wish you could tell me. I, uh, you know, I, I feel like Dale Staling's case in Mesa Verde was one of those cases. I mean, they, um, it, it sounds like where they did find his remains, um, he, he should have been spotted from the air in those first couple of days of the search. Um, that is a really strange phenomenon, and it happens. Um, it happens repeatedly, and uh, I just, I just don't know the answer to that. It's a mystery. There are people who are, for lack of a better expression, just hell bent on searching for missing people. And I want to talk about, or have you talk about one of them right here. There's a woman you describe in the book who drives nine hours round trip every weekend to help search for someone. There's another guy who spends every spare hour he's got going into the bush looking for people. He offers thousands of dollars of reward money. It's his own money. These people are not related to the people who are missing, and yet they do it. Why do they do it? You know, I've, I've learned throughout the research for this, Steve, there's a, there are so many people out there with huge hearts, and they, and they want to put their skills to use in, in helping these families. And, and the, you know, the story that, that really doesn't get told when it comes to missing persons is, you know, the people who are left behind. And, and I feel like, um, I feel like largely these people who are dedicating their, their, their finances and their time and their, their skill sets, um, in, to, to finding some answers, um, are, are really doing it largely for the, for the families. And we're not just talking about people out there, you know, putting their hiking boots on and going out for a few hours. Talk about some of the, the lengths to which they'll go to help search. My, um, Michael Niger lives here in, in Marquette County, Michigan. And that, that's a, that's a, that's a strange happenstance that, uh, uh, I tried to find someone with his skill set who, who was as dedicated to him, who searches in the remote territory that he does. And I couldn't find anyone anywhere. Um, he spends a lot of time in Ontario. Uh, he has a lot of cold cases that he's still working on. And many of them are on the North shore of Lake Superior and, um, and throughout Ontario. But um, you know he he is a he's a retired Michigan State police officer, and um, extremely physically fit. And um, he he leads uh, wilderness trips in um, extreme winter weather, uh, ski trips, canoe trips, and so he's he's very very qualified for this. And he happens to apply those skills 
to going miles and miles into the bush and in, in awful conditions, mosquitoes or extreme cold, um, trying to find some clues to, uh, to give back to these families of missing persons. But you've got other people in the book who are using airplanes and helicopters and drones. And I mean, it, it's really quite incredible the lengths to which they'll go for people they don't even know. Absolutely. Uh, you know, dog handlers, um, you know, people that, that really, you know, um, I enjoy I enjoy cycling and, and fishing in my spare time. These people enjoy um, training and um, and and going out into these remote places uh, looking looking for answers. And, and, and again, you know, to help families. Well, speaking of helicopters and those kinds of rescue items, uh, let's give our viewers a sense of some of the ordeal that these people go through when they get lost. And this is the story of a woman named Amanda Eller. She was supposed to be out for a jog in Maui and it became a 17 day horror show. Here's the story. She ate plants she didn't know and wild strawberry guava when she could find them. For protein, she swallowed an occasional moth. Maui waterfalls look fresh on postcards but can contain leptospira, a genus of bacteria that causes a whole buffet of problems including meningitis, kidney failure, and death. But to not drink meant certain death. She lost almost 20 pounds in those 17 days. In addition to her broken leg, Amanda had a severe skin infection from sunburn. She said she'd heard and seen several helicopters previously, but none had spotted her. I looked up and they were right on top of me. I was like, oh my God, and I just broke down and started bawling. She had walked and crawled about 30 miles. This is one of those many incredible stories, John, you tell in the book. Uh, we do need to know, did she survive? That, that's a happy ending. That's one, that's one of the, the several happy endings. Yes, Steve, um, she did survive. And um, th that's, a, that's a great story, not only for her strength and, um, and, and, and you know, just commitment to, to not perishing in, in the wilderness, but uh, the people that rallied and um, stayed in the search camp after the official authorities had abandoned the search. How'd she go missing in the first place? She was out for a, a run, just a, she didn't plan to be out long, just, um, just an outing in, in, a, in a familiar part of, uh, part of Maui where um, she just liked to go and um, got turned around. And that, that happens, you know, I, I get turned around in familiar, um, familiar country near my house. And, <laughs> and um, you know, nobody thinks they're gonna, gonna get lost or turned around and it just, it, it just happened. And um, one of the things that can happen, especially a fit athlete like Amanda, is um, you know when you're determined that you're headed back the right direction, you can um, very quickly put the miles underneath you and um, become much more lost. Yeah, there, there are so many different degrees of horrifying in the stories that you tell. I mean, getting lost and feeling helpless is one. Getting lost, feeling helpless, looking up in the sky and seeing a potential rescuer not see you fly by, that has, I mean, what do people tell you about the level of just deep angst they feel when that happens. Right, well, that, uh, that almost happened to Amanda. That, her case is in some ways a miracle because she was spotted, spotted by a helicopter. The helicopter was running low on fuel. They were getting ready to turn back around. They, they, just, they were doing a scouting run. They weren't really um, actively searching in that area. They were looking for uh, the, the ground that they were gonna search in the next couple of days. And so um, it, it, everything fell into place, and, and it, you know that's that's about as close to a miracle as you can get. But yeah, um, yeah, the emotion that, that she uh, that she went through is just um, uh, other human. Mm -hmm. We do need to talk about the families that are left behind, even if there's a happy ending. There are families that go through you know lengthy periods of time where they don't know what's going on, and you describe an emotion that they go through. You describe it as frozen grief. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, there's a, a psychologist uh, named Pauline Boss who um, who also calls it um, an ambiguous loss, and and she says that it's the it's the hardest thing that a human being can endure. Your loved one is missing, and you don't you don't know why, you don't know where, you don't know how, and um, it, it's just you know having spent time with with the families, especially um, Randy Gray, the father of. Uh, a sort of the main case in my book. Um, it, it's I, I don't, as a father myself, I don't know that I could I could uh, endure what some of these families do endure. So it says a lot about about human strength and heart. 
Well, you should, uh, you can go into some detail there. His son, Jacob Gray, went missing, and Randy basically said what? He, he said, I'm, I'm going to find my son. And, and um, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, um, I, I, I see families split between, you know, when they don't know what happened to their to their loved one. They don't know whether their their son or daughter is is alive or, or have perished. Um, you know, they're optimists and they're a pessimist. And um, I understand the pessimist, but Randy Gray um, is my new model of, of the ultimate optimist. He would wake up every morning and, and just uh, say, what am I going to do to find my son today? He, he liquidated his, his successful construction business in California, essentially moved into a camper, uh, a, mobile, a mobile home, and, and hit the road. And um, we spent time in, in Washington State and Western British Columbia and um, I, I've never seen a human being with so much um, determination and dedication. How did Jacob go missing in the first place? J Jacob was a, a keen surfer, an athlete, and he'd just gotten into touring cycling. So he, uh, he was planning on a cross-country trip from Washington State to Vermont. And um, he was preparing gear and doing some test runs. And he had loaded up uh, his bike trailer, a, a, a renovated uh, child carrier full of camping gear. He had fishing rods. He had a, he had a bow and arrows and, um, he wasn't planning on going fast. He was just gonna, he was just gonna live, live off the bike. And, uh, he went out on, on what they think was a test run in a storm one night in April of 2017. And Rangers discovered his bike and trailer and gear along the soul duck river in Olympic national park. And, um, that's all they knew. And the early assumption was that he somehow fell into the river and, and, and drowned. But his father, Randy, knowing that Jacob was such a, such a, a skilled surfer, um, for, first of all, doubted that theory. However, Randy himself was a, is a, an elite level surfer. And, um, it, it was something to see watching how he and his friends searched that river. Um, they literally overturned every rock at the bottom of that river. And so what they could do then is eliminate the probability that Jacob perished in the river. He's somewhere else. And so um, Randy believed that his son, you know, son was athletic, healthy, strong, smart. He was out there in the world and just um, on a walkabout, he called it, and didn't, didn't want to be, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't want to be social for a time being. And so um, that led us uh, not only in the park, but outside the park, uh, searching for his son. And Randy never had a day where he thought, my son is probably dead, but I'm going to keep looking anyway? I, you know, I, he, he may have, but I didn't see it. I didn't see it. You know, um, from, you know, sun up to till past sundown, it was, um, we're going to find Jacob. He would talk about Jacob in the present tense. When I find Jacob, I'm going to give him back his surfboard. I'm going to give him this camper. Um, you know, it was really, uh, Randy Gray's spirit is, um, is pretty incredible. It's interesting you say they talk about their kids in the present tense. Do they, if the, if the children are not found, do the parents ever stop talking about their kids in the present tense? I believe Randy Gray would still be talking about Jacob in the present tense. Um, that's a really good question. Um, and, you know, what, what effect does time have um, years and years and years after someone has gone missing. Um, I, I don't know that anyone ever gets used to, to the idea, um, but I know Randy Gray um, would still be talking about Jacob in the present tense. It is completely understandable that some parents turn to the supernatural world for answers, such as what? Well, in, in, in Jacob's case, Bigfoot. And, um, you know, he, of course, social media comes into play and, um, the, the gray family got a Facebook message from, uh, a native American and indigenous woman in, in Washington state who lived at the base of Mount Rainier. And, um, she claimed to have, uh, spoken to a family of Bigfoot who, who knew where Jacob might be. And so, you know, the one thing Steve, you'll do when your when your son goes missing is you'll you'll follow leads that um you know previously you would think were hmm. were wild hairs and just um you know make believe but but when you have when you have few other things to go on 
you'll go meet with a woman who claims to to speak with Bigfoot. And, um, you know, that that was interesting that that didn't lead to anything. But but we did uh, we did have help from Bigfoot researchers who were incredible in the the assistance they gave the search with their with their knowledge, with their athleticism, their dedication. Um, so I came away from it with, um, you know, I think I went into this as a skeptic and I came out of it just with a, with a tremendous respect for, um, these people who, who believe in, in, in things, um, that you, you can assign to the paranormal. John, half of me thinks we ought to tell people what happened ultimately with the gray case. And the other half of me thinks, well, you know, it, it's kind of the big mystery of your book and we shouldn't give it away here. I'm in your hands. How do you want to play it? Well, yeah, we, you know, I, I wish that Randy could go on speaking about Jacob in the present tense. And, and unfortunately, um, that's not true. But they they do have some answers in what happened to Jacob. And I and um, I I think there is a sense of I hate to even call it peace, but there's there is a, uh, some sense of. Uh, you know, what the proverbial closure that the family could have. Um, I guess I maybe won't go into how how he was found, but um, but he was found. And the story did not have a happy ending. Right. Just finally, you wrote that you you dream about these missing people a lot. That's what you said. Do you still? I do. I, oh, wow. Um, Steve, I wish I could turn it off. And um, uh, two nights ago, I yeah, I, I um, it, it, it's frequent, and um, um, I I think probably I'll I'll always have these dreams. And and like I say, I you know I I can't claim to have gone through anything like uh, like say Randy Gray. And so it, it, to me, it's still unimaginable how how a human can endure that. Yeah. Well, um, John, we've had thousands upon thousands of guests on this program, but I'm pretty sure I'm on safe ground in saying we've never before had a guest that lived in a log cabin on the Chocolate River in Michigan. So you are a first, no doubt about it. And this story is amazing. I, I, I'm honored. I, I really appreciate it, Steve. Not at all. The Cold Vanish, Seeking the Missing in North America's Wildlands. John Billman, take good care, and thanks for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.